Hello everyone, you're all very welcome indeed to our Society of Actuaries webinar this evening for fifth and sixth year students. If of course you're joining us and you're not in fifth or sixth year, of course you're still absolutely more than welcome. And I was just checking there on my various different social media before we started and I see that yet again, Maths Week is trending. Uh, so that's it's great that we are being able to run this webinar this evening in association with Maths Week. So I'm just going to give you a chance to all uh, join us here, which is super to see such great numbers. And I can still see that you're flying in here and you are more than welcome. Before we get started, I have a couple of things to talk through. Number one, I want to, of course, give a really warm welcome to every single person who's joining us, either whether you're joining us live right now or whether you're checking out the recording afterwards. But I will let you know that this is a 90 minute session, but it's highly, highly in, uh, interactive. So we will be walking you through what life is like as an actor. You're going to hear from Ashling Bernach shortly. She's going to tell you what life is like as a practicing actuary. And then after that, I am going to be leading you through a series of tasks where I'm going to be asking you to think like an actuary so that you get a sense of the types of decisions that they need to make the type of work that you might be doing, the type of logic and problem solving and creativity that you need to apply, the type of sources that you'd be looking at, the data sets that you would be analyzing, etc. So make sure uh, that you are well charged up, both you and your device, in order to join us for that. And then after that, we have a panel discussion where I will be interviewing two women. I'm going to be interviewing Rebecca and Maraid, all about what life is like for them in their own respective actuarial profession. Now, while all of that will be going on while I'm here with you, in addition as well, we are very, very encouraging of everybody to send in your questions through the Q&A pod. Now, as I point uh, down here, this is where the Q&A pod is appearing on my screen. It's right down at the bottom. Uh, so if you click on Q&A there, we have some really fantastic people, including Catherine and Jenny and Jennifer, who are answering your questions in real time. OK, so send your questions in. Our speakers may or may not get to them um, and we'll, we'll see about that but in addition what we also want to make sure is that number one you get your questions asked number two of course that you get them answered and thirdly that other people can see what the questions and answers are as well now in addition if you have anything that you need to send to us as a dm as a direct message then you can use the chat function to do that and using the chat function what you can do is you can send a message there to hosts and panelists uh, because while you may be seeing me here currently on that stage of sorts, like I say, there is an army of people behind behind me who is making sure that everything is taking, 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 being taken care of along the way. So in summary, a couple of quick things. Number one, as I say, we're going to start off with Ashling Bernock, who's going to walk us through what life is like as a practicing actuary. Then after that, uh, the second thing we're going to do is an active learning session with me. And then thirdly, we're going to move into a panel discussion, but please do send in your questions right the way through. Send them in through the Q&A pod right the way through and we'll make sure that they're taken care of. Now, very quick background on me before I introduce Ashley. First of all, my name is Susan Hayes Cullerton and I could have been an actuary. I was on my way, but uh, for me, life took a different turn. When I was in fifth and sixth year, I was studying Irish, English, maths, applied maths, physics, chemistry, accounting and French. I decided that I wanted to pursue actuary when I was in transition year. It was the career that I had researched the most and I actually went to UCD to meet with the head of department there as part of my research for that course. It was then I went on and no, there was different actuarial courses available at the time, but I chose Galway financial maths and economics in Galway as my number one choice, which I got. Here's a quick statistic for you. 80% of people who apply to the CAO system in Ireland get one of their top three choices. Did you know? Uh, and therefore, I was one of those people who was one of the 80%. And in fact, as I say, I got my top choice, which was financial maths and economics in Galway. Off I went, very much intending to pursue that path. And then uh, and there was actuarial exemptions. If you're not familiar with what that term is, you soon will know all about them when you hear from the various different people who are here to talk to you. But anyway, off I went and I did. I studied the course, finished it, uh, have my degree and everything else. 
Uh, but along the way, I met the Business Society in college and I ended up going on to pursue um, setting up my own business. And then I went on to become a CFA, a Chartered Financial Analyst. I also have co-authored the Leaving Cert Economics textbook, Positive Economics. So if any of you were studying economics as a subject this year or uh, next year, um, you may come across my name at the front of your textbook. And then uh, I went on to set up my own company called Hey Culleton. I'm the Hayes, he's the Culleton, in 2010. And the reason that I'm here with you all tonight is because we run the uh, Transition Year Work Experience Programme for the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. So my life has actually come full circle, where I started off planning and very much pursuing the path of the actuarial profession. Now I actually work with the Society of Actuaries in Ireland in a very different guise. So you never know where life is going to take you. Now, as I say, Please do feel free, send in your questions. I'm going to be asking you loads of questions and I'll be asking you for your answers in the active learning session that we have planned for you in a little while. But before that, I'm going to ask, please, Ashling, can you please switch on your camera? Join me here on, as I say, on, on stage. If, if I could ask you to do that, please. And we can see there, here you are. Now, Ashling Bernat is going to walk you through, as I say, life is a practicing actuary. And I'm going to hide my camera and I'm going to see you in a little while. Like I say, please do send in the questions as many as you have. We're only delighted to hear from you. Ashley, floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Susan. So as Susan mentioned, my name is Ashley Brannock and I'm an actuary. And I'm also chair of the Diversity, Equity, Accessibility and Inclusion Committee with the Society of Actuaries. And I'm one of the volunteers that helps organise this webinar and also the transition year programme that will be happening again in February and March next year. So I did my leave insert way back in 2004 in Strokesdown County, Roscommon. I actually did have actuarial and financial maths as my first choice in DCU on the CAO form. But unlike Susan, I hadn't actually done a huge pile of research. Uh, I actually had no idea what it was about other than if you're good at maths, it's something you should think about. But I'm glad to say it was definitely the right choice for me. And I did get into DCU and spent a good four years there. When I graduated, I moved to a company called Irish Life, which is an insurance company. And I've actually been working there ever since. I started off as an actuarial student and worked my way through both the professional exams and a number of different roles in there. Throughout my time in Irish Life, I've actually been really fortunate to work in a number of different departments and also alongside a number of different departments. So that would include things like customer service, IT, marketing and even our investment managers. And more recently, I've actually been really fortunate to work with some of my colleagues in the UK, Canada and the US. So my roles have been very varied and I've been very lucky to work in a diverse number of different areas. Uh, my current role, I apologise in advance, it is a bit of a mouthful. I am Head of Data Analytics for Internal Audit in Europe. It sounds a little bit boring to you, I'm sure, but actually it is quite exciting and I'm very much at the forefront of how Irish Life and actually our greater kind of global company are using AI and looking at how we can utilise it within the organisation to make us more efficient and actually leaving us free to work on the more exciting value add stuff. But that's plenty about me now. So I'm actually here to tell you what an actuary actually is and what we do. Um, so I'm going to try and share a slide. So hopefully all goes well on this. And that is sharing for you now. Fingers crossed. Um, it, is, it is indeed, Ashley. Yep. Well, oh, fantastic. I... Brilliant. So the first bit, I'm actually just going to read off the slide. And I hate doing this. But at a general level, an actuary is a business professional who designs solutions to problems that involve financial risk or future uncertainty. They use statistical and mathematical techniques to study past events and anticipate future events. Now, I will be touching on the word uncertainty quite a bit in the next few minutes. But for now, I'd like to focus on that word future. And that's because that's what really differentiates some of the actuarial work from accounting work. So if you were to think about an accountant's work, they tend to look at past events and make sure that they're being reported and accounted for ac accurately. Whereas as an actuary, you tend to be looking to the future. So how likely is an event going to happen? And if it does happen, how much is it likely going to cost? So putting a financial value on that future uncertainty. In terms of day-to-day -day work, 
actuarial work, as I've mentioned already about my own work, it is very varied. A lot of actuaries do work in the insurance and pension sector, but you will find actuaries involved in trading, banking, and even aviation. And actually, to be honest, even within the insurance and pensions area, there's a lot of actuaries who work in purely what we would call technical actuarial roles, like the head of actuarial function. But you'll also find a lot of actuaries working as the CEO, the chief financial officer, the chief risk officer, and even within my own organization, you you wouldn't be unusual to find them being head of marketing, head of compliance, or even as head of customer service. So it's very much viewed as a well-respected profession, and you will find actuaries in lots of positions across the financial services. So this slide does cover a little bit on the day-to-day -day work that an actuary can be involved in. Um, before I jump into the first one, I'd like to give you a little bit of an example. And again, trying to compare accountancy with actuary. So if you took a really simple example of you walk into a shop and you buy a pair of shoes and you give the shopkeeper the money for those shoes, an accountant would deduct the shoes from the company's assets and add the money that you pay back in as an asset on the balance sheet. So if we were to make that a little bit more complicated and think about something like car insurance, in car insurance, you hand over your premium, but the insurance company does not give you anything back straight away. In fact, they will only pay a claim if something were to happen, like if you were to have an accident, crash the car or damage the car. So the insurance company has an asset on the balance sheet. So the money that they receive for the insurance premium, but now they need to figure out how they allow for the potential claim. And that's where an actuary comes in. An actuary will estimate how likely you are to claim if you are to claim when that is likely to happen and how much it is likely to cost. Now, again, that may sound simple enough, but if you think about it from the point of view of an insurance company where you're doing it for hundreds and thousands of claims and it's not just for car insurance, it gets very complicated. So that's very much our wheelhouse, dealing with uncertainty. The second piece there is calculating the premiums for insurance. Now, this isn't a million miles away from what I just described, because, again, you're trying to set a premium, allowing to make sure it's fair for the customer, but also that the company will still meet their profit criteria by estimating the future likelihood of them paying claims. Now, this would be wider than just car insurance. This could cover things like life insurance, where we pay an amount out on death or serious illness on healthcare, where we pay an amount on private treatment, or even something simple like phone insurance, if you were to, where we pay out if you were to lose or your phone was stolen. So that's just kind of covering those first two bullets there. The next piece is kind of advising people on how much they would need to save for a certain event, or even how much they would need now to start saving now in order to meet their retirement requirements so that they can retire on a living wage. The last one then is around risk management. And as I've mentioned, actuaries very much work in the world of uncertainty and estimating future costs in an uncertain world. And that leads them with the skills necessary to support the companies as they look to manage their risks around uncertain events. So that's just kind of some of the examples. <clears throat> we very much work in other areas as well, but they will be the key areas that you'll see actuaries working in. On the right-hand side of the slide, we've got what, the heading slightly misleading. It says skills needed to be an actuary. I would argue that these are skills that you would build if you choose to follow an actuarial career. In the center is maths. So that's foundational to, to a lot of the work that you will do. I myself would also put problem solving in there. But really this, this circle would be a very good description of how my own career path has evolved and the skills that I've learned along the way. So starting at the coding IT side, I very much was involved in the coding, in the, in the weeds of the coding at the time. Now it was VBA and SQL, showing my age again but we very much have moved on from that these days the next bit is economics and again I'd even link that to business acumen and really understanding how businesses make money and how they support their customers and how you can allow for all those stakeholders when you're doing the various day-to-day -day jobs that I mentioned earlier as I've moved through my career things like problem solving have become a lot more important. And as I've already mentioned, I'm very much active in the AI and data analytics space. So very much looking at new and innovative ways of us performing our roles and how they can support our company. Um, but alongside that comes risk. So we're not just evaluating, this is a cool tool and make things really easy and make our lives much easier. But we also need to see, well, what extra risks are we as an organization taking on if we choose to invest and use that tool? And then the last piece I would point to is communicating and presenting. Now, a lot of people would have 
the opinion that actuaries just sit behind a computer and code all day or work in spreadsheets all day. And that is absolutely not true. And I know you already know that from all the examples I've given before. But as you move through your career, communicating and presenting becomes more and more important. And particularly as actuaries, we are working in very technical areas and we tend to have a very good understanding of the real technical work that we're that we're working on. But the reality is we need to then be able to translate that into plain English and share that with multiple stakeholders across the organization. So that would be very much a key skill. But I wouldn't be worried if you don't have that now, because it's very much something that you can build as you work through your career as an actuary. So you'll be glad to hear now that that's a lot of my talking over and done with. So I'll be handing back to Susan now for the panelist event. And as she mentioned, Myself and my colleagues are online available to answer any questions you have throughout the session. So please do put in any or all questions that you have in relation to what I've talked about or anything that's on your mind in relation to an actuarial career or degree. Thanks a million, Ashling. I can tell you that everybody has been taking your advice because the questions have been flying in <laughs> for sure. And um, already I can see that there's there's eight of them, uh, eight of them have, have been answered at, at this point. Um, Ashling, just before we, we move on, I just would like to ask you two questions. One is, it's interesting that you say, I didn't actually realise, by the way, we did the Junior Cert, Leaving Cert in the same year, which was 2004. So happy 20th anniversary to you too. Oh, don't but, say that. <laughs> um, but when you say that you didn't do an awful lot of research and you said it sounds like maths is, is an interesting thing to do or actually would be a good match to it. What or who inspired you to particularly pursue actuary? Because there's lots of careers you could have pursued believe somebody had mentioned to me and this is not the best reason for pursuing somebody so I would suggest everybody here does their research and listen to what we did today I was told if you like maths and you like money you should become an actuary and that was enough wow. for me which is saying more about me than anything else okay if you like maths and you like money okay now if I was on if I was just on the listening side of tonight I know that that's something I would be uh I'd be putting up on Instagram straight away um second question then Ashling is this so you have been a, a practicing actor now for over a decade. And can I ask you, how has your job changed? So has it been, you know, you mentioned there about data analytics, for example. That I'm not sure people would have been talking about that, certainly when we were in Living Search anyway. Uh, now, of course, there's AI. You mentioned that that's another area you work in. So how has your job changed over the years in line with developments or has it changed at all? So my job has massively changed. So as I mentioned, I kind of started, I would have been very much on the coding side, but we didn't do as much as we would do now because data analytics didn't exist, although it sort of did at a different guise in the actuarial circle. Whereas now a lot of my time is spent understanding new innovation in this space. So AI in particular is a big piece that's coming through for us now, but also a lot of my work is bringing other people along with me. So I'm less in the weeds and working on the coding myself and more coaching others as they deliver that work, but also delivering out our message to our key stakeholders globally, which can be quite quite uh, time consuming when you consider uh, the different time zones. Well, I think, you know, any time that you talk about global stakeholders, it sounds so glamorous, so wonderful. <laughs> um, Ashley, that that's super. I'm going to, as you say, take it from here. I'm going to leave the active learning session now. So if you're good to go, you might switch off the camera in that case. And I'll, and I'll take it from here. And we know that, that, that you're going to be there in the background. So thanks a million for that. Like we say, keep the questions coming in. We're only delighted to have them. But now it's my turn to start asking you questions along the way. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I am going to give you a link. And I'm going to ask you to click on this link in the chat. If it is the case that you are on a laptop, let's say, and you prefer to use your phone, that's okay. I'm going to give you a QR code and you can join us instead. But just want to, first of all, give you all a chance to click on the link there that I gave to you. Okay. Now, just gone full screen there and where I wanted to go. And I'm going to now share my screen. And in this, I am going to hold up a QR code here. There we are. Now, there's a QR code. If you would prefer to join us from QR code, please do go ahead and give me a thumbs up there when you're when you've logged in. Okay. So we have 
lots and lots of participants from all around the country and I have a lot of questions to ask you over the next 40 minutes. So, okay, we're at 13, 14. There's a lot more of you than that here. So either click on the link that I gave you in the chat or alternatively, you can also hold up your phone to the QR code or alternatively, again, go to menti.com and put in the code 53256041. And like I say, there's a lot more of you here than, than 31 that has given me the thumbs up so far. So I'm just going to give everyone until 1921. One more minute. And uh, let's see. Let's see the actuarial talent that we have here with us this evening. Now, wh while all of those are 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 being being sent into us, like I said, the team is answering questions there in the background, and we'll also have a panel discussion again in a little while. So, okay, all right. Now, what I'm going to do there is I'm going to move on, and I'm now going to ask you the first question. Okay, so true or false? So the question is: eighty-five percent of centenarians are women, and fifteen percent are men. Is that true or false? And a centenarian is somebody who is aged 100 or more. So do you think that 85% of the people in the world who are over 100, are they women? Okay, so we're getting, so far I have 50 answers. 46 of you, out of the 56, 58. Out of the 58 of you that have answered me so far, 50 of you are, think that, uh, that 85% of centenarians, such a hard word to say, are women and 15% are men. And you are correct. You are correct. That is that is the case. So the likelihood of a woman living to 100 is, 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 is as you can see here, much higher than the likelihood of a man being do, do, doing the same. I'll also give you another statistic while we're here, and that is the super center centenarians. So that's someone over 110. In that case, 90% of people who live to that age are women. There you go. All right. So next up, let's hear what you have to say for this. What is the average? Now, better, now, go and research this. Don't guess it. Go and research it. What is the average life expectancy of a person in the world, a woman in Ireland, a man in Ireland, a person in Australia, a man in India, a woman in the Netherlands? And like I say, go and research this now. Don't guess it. Go and research it. Go and take a look. Actuaries don't guess. They research. And now let's hear what you have to say on that. I'm going to keep quiet for this one now and give you a chance. Okay. One person answered me so far. And refresh your mentee so that you can see what's on my screen. Mm -hmm. Two answers so far. Okay, take your time, research it. Take your time. Just wanna see how accurate you are. So what is the average life expectancy of a person in the world, a woman in Ireland, a man in Ireland, a person in Australia, a man in India, and a woman in the Netherlands? So far you think a woman in the Netherlands would outlive a woman in Ireland. Okay, we'll see. I've only five answers so far. Seven answers, okay, take your time. Just think, think, research, take your time, get it right. I have very little agreement. I can tell that because I can see all of the different answers that are coming in there at different spots. And the latest set of answers are actually pulling all the life expectancies back. Twenty-one answers so far. Okay, a lot of you are still working on it. That's fine. Okay. 
Okay, starting to get a little bit of agreement now. So based on the 40 answers that I have so far, we're getting a little bit of agreement. 20 of you are picking an answer over here. Uh, these answers here, I have one and two and threes and fours uh, are all over here. Where's the congregation happening here? 24 of you have an answer, of the same answer for a woman in Ireland and 14 of you have a different one. It looks like now as well, the Irish women are beginning to win the race. So you have an Irish woman at 83 currently, and you have a woman in the Netherlands at 82 and a half. Right, we're up to, we're up, we're up to where are we at? We're at 60 answers, right? Now, based on based on what I've, what I've seen so far in, in other answers that you've given me, I think probably 60 is, is a good number, all right, to compare this against. Okay, now, I don't know the answer. If you were to ask me any of these right here, I wouldn't know, nor would you expect me to know. But what I would expect me to do is to go and find this out. And what I did here is that I found all of these answers on, were on Worldometer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now research each of these. So person in the world. Person in the world, the average life expectancy of a person in the world is 73.3 years. 73.3 years. Okay. 13 of you. 13 of you. Yeah, 34 people, what did 34 people say? 34 people here had had an answer of just about, just underneath that. So this is what, based on my source. Now, of course, remember, <laughs> these are life expectancies that can come from actuarial tables. And this is the source that I'm working from. So 72.7 is what you're telling me here. 73.3 is what, based on my, my source that I have. Okay, next, next up over here. A woman in Ireland. Let's just see now. What have we got to say here about a woman in Ireland? Uh, I'm going to scroll on down here. Control F is my friend. Search Ireland. Right, here we are. Woman in Ireland, like myself. And in this case, I am currently, uh, the life expectancy is 84.61. What did you say? You said 83. Right. Estimating me. So 20, 83 is what is what you're saying currently on average the life expectancy is that's what the group here and we've 68 answers now great great to see that there's more people about it. right man in Ireland now you have a man in Ireland living for a shorter period of time than a woman in Ireland which is accurate uh, man in Ireland a man in Ireland is expected to live 80 years 80 and a half we'll give the half okay so 80 and a half that looks to be most accurate relative to what my source that I'm looking at now, a person in Australia, you think now Bondi Beach, nice bit of sun and so on. So a person in Australia, and there's a lot, 47 of you picked the same number. Okay, so a person in Australia, let's see what Worldometer says. Australia. Australia, 80, 82, 82. It's, so it's higher, higher than uh, 82. It's higher than the average. 81.7 is what, what you gave them. Now, dramatic difference here. Down here, a dramatic difference when it comes to a man in India. So, I uh, inter interesting. A man in India, you are saying, on average, 70 of you answering now. It's great. Man in India, you're saying 68.3 years. Let me go and take a look at that. A man in India. India. Man in India is expected to live 70. 70 years. So, lower, certainly, than Ireland or some of the other countries there that I put forward. So you can see a man in India there, 68.3 is what you said. It's actually higher. And finally, now, the Dutch woman, like uh, the original answers that were coming in, it looked to be that a woman in the Netherlands that you had was going to be uh, able to live longer than a woman in Ireland. So now let's let's get what the reality is there. Netherlands. Netherlands. Uh, a female is expected to live 83.85, whereas a woman in Ireland is expected to live longer. There you go. You heard it here first. All right, great stuff. Now, uh, let's move on and let's move on to our next uh, next question. Now, read this carefully now first, right? Since 2000, so since the year 2000, it's currently 2024 to anyone who hasn't been paying attention. By how many years has life expectancy increased? Sorry, that should, that should say, uh, I, I have a typo there now and I don't like typos. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to fix that while you go and research it. And go and research it. Don't guess, go and research it. So the question is, the question is, and I'm just going to uh, take take that out there. The question is, since 2000, how many years did life expectancy increase in Malta? Now, it's back. 
and it's right and I'm much happier with it. Okay. How many years did life expectancy increase? So if you were born in Malta in 2000 versus being born in Malta today, how many years has life expectancy increased? Now, I didn't want to simply ask, do you think it increased or decreased? Because in the developed world, a lot of it has, a lot of life expectancy has increased. So, so far, we have got uh, 1920 answers. Okay, we got 70 on the last one. And the reason that I picked Malta is I was actually presenting there at a conference this morning. I couldn't make it over. I'm currently in Dublin. I was invited to speak at a conference this morning and I couldn't physically be in two places at once. I have tried it many times. So instead, I actually was in the office this morning for 7.30 a.m. for a tech check. And then I was presenting to an audience at, at 8.15. Irish time finished for 8.45. Irish time again. And then got on my Dublin bikes, cycled into the office, started my day. And um, I've done a lot of business over the years in Malta. It's a great, great part of the world. Okay, that's the reason I picked it. Now, let's just see what we have going on here. So what are we hearing? 29 of you saying, 30 of you saying four. Okay. Uh, a lot, of, okay. So, right, let's just see here what the answer is. And the answer is four. Part of your work, correct. Now, where I got that was the World Health Organization. I want to show you specifically where I got that. It's the World Health Organization. And I actually brought this up in the conversation that I, that I presented to them. Look at the difference here. Look at the difference in life expectancy, right? So th this is from 2000, is that it has actually increased by four years for everyone, right? For males, for females, and in general, it has increased, you can see there, and what I just think is interesting is the fact that from 2015 until 2021, uh, over that period of time, that, that the, the increase has actually leveled, leveled off. But up here, you can see how it's looking between 2023, which is last year, and 2050. So you can see that this means that the population is aging. It means that as people, these this age group here in 2023 is that they will become this age group over here in 2050. So you can see that the population is aging and also that there is a lower birth rate. So, for example, last in 2050, there's expected to be 8,200 people who are female age group between zero and four. Whereas in 2023 last year, that was actually 20 20 percent higher than what it's expected to be. Now, how is this relevant? Right. It's super relevant for all of us, because the reality is, is that people up here, will be in receipt of the pensions that you as the future actuaries are going to calculate. And people down here, well, not down here, but in around here are going to be paying taxes into the government, who is then going to have to manage that money on behalf of the state so that as those people age, and as you can see, get up here into these age groups, then they can live a, 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 nice, a nice lifestyle. And of course, your kids will then be studying down here and you will have to help them with their education so that they can support your pensions. That is the way this works. So as you can see here, the way in which the demographic change is expected to happen is exactly as you see it. And similarly as well, you can see that um, in 2050, it's expected to be 20,000 women over 85 and 14,300 men at the time. All right. Now, back to work here. All right, let's keep going. Now, according to this time, I'm going to ask you to write. So according to the Mercer Pension Report, rank the order of these countries according to the integrity of their pensions systems. Okay, so integrity means how much we can trust them because there's no point in me putting money into a pension if I don't actually think that I'm going to get it back. So, and particularly, there's no point in me paying money into a, a government pension if I don't think, when push comes to shove, that, I, that I'm going to get the money back. Right, only one of you so far has got in there and made fees and researched them. Don't guess, research. We've time. Now, I have a lot of questions to ask, but we've time for them all. Time for them all. The panel discussion starting at eight o'clock. So we're working all the way between now and then. So far, you're telling me Norway, Finland, and Hong Kong. Now, I picked these countries because they were specifically listed on the Mercer Pension Report. It wasn't random. I've been to Finland. I have actually been to Hong Kong more, and I will be in Norway next July. That is entirely irrelevant to the question. That has nothing got to do with our pension system whatsoever. But, of course, the, the other things to point out here is that Norway and Finland are in Scandinavia. Hong Kong is in Asia. Very, very, very different system. Oh, I wonder is, going to, is Finland going to 
Push ahead in our way. Only 23 of you so far. 24. Let's just see now. Right. Let's just see. And I I can I show you my source. My source is the Mercer Pension Report. Let's just see what you have to say. Okay, only 41. There's a lot more than that here. A lot more than that here. I have the Mercer Report here that I will be pulling up here shortly. Now, the Mercer Report is, first of all, a great read. And there's other metrics as well that I'm going to show you on it. Right, 52 of you. Right, um, 1935. So I'm going to start answering this, right? For anybody who's still researching it, keep going. Keep keep going. Because the speed of your answer is not the right, is not what I'm looking for. The accuracy of your answer is what I'm looking for. So you're telling me that according to the Mercer Pension Report, you're telling me that you feel that the Finnish uh, pension system has more integrity, as in one can trust it more than the Norwegian one, which one can trust more than the Hong Kong one. Okay, just one point to note here is, remember in Norway, they do have a sovereign wealth fund, like we do now in Ireland. So in Norway, they generated a sovereign wealth fund because they extracted oil. And in our case, we have a specifically hot, very high level of corporation tax that we have been getting in from multinationals. So that's what is going into our sovereign wealth fund. Anyway, let's move over here, take a look. And the answer is Finland, Norway, and Hong Kong. You are spot on. So it is in this order, Finland number one, Norway number two, Hong Kong number three. Now, this is, and there's three other metrics in here. And again, great report in there. But how much do you get? So adequacy means, adequacy is the word that refers to how much am I going to get relative to what I might need. Now, I'll be asking about the Irish pension system a little bit later on. But in this order, as you can see here, in the Netherlands, you get you get a lot. Then, then the next one is France. And then the third one, Uruguay, which is in South America. What I, what I find interesting here is that the life expectancy in the Netherlands is, very, is quite significantly long, a bit like in Ireland. So when it comes to adequacy, well, then you know that you're going to have a long life. And the Dutch tend to do that. If you've ever been to the Netherlands, fabulous part of the world as well. But you'll, you, you'll see what I mean. And then the second thing is, uh, so if you have people who are living for a long time and they're getting a significant amount of money, then, of course, there is going to be pressure in the government to continue to provide that. Where do they get it? Taxes and contributions and so many other things. Now, over here, sustainability. Sustainability has nothing got to do with green or environmental. In, in this context, it is can the system keep going? Can the system keep going? Can the system keep delivering? And as you can see here, Iceland is up number one. Denmark is up number two. Now, and this isn't necessarily um, in the only in the only order. That there's, there's a lot more countries involved here as well. Look at this again, though. Iceland and Denmark over here. Finland and Norway. You can see that the Scandinavian countries really are setting the tone here for pensions in Europe. Okay, now let's move on then to our next question. 61 answers to that. How much in euro is the full contributory weekly state pension in Ireland 2024? Before the budget, right? I'm not taking into consideration what happened in the budget. When, how much in euro, in euro, is the full weekly state pension in Ireland 2024? Refresh your screens. Refresh, refresh your screens. They're going to the same. Just make sure that you get the question. And go and research it. Everyone now should give me the same answer here. Go and research this. Please, go and research it, please. You should all have the same answer. Okay, there's no point. The answer is super quick to get. So how much in euro is the full weekly pension in 2024? 17 answers so far. Yeah, 19 answers so far. Most of them are all the ones, but I'm sure they're all going to be all right, by the way. That spike should just, that spike should, right, how many have I got? 23 answers. 23 answers of my 28 are all the same number. I'm guessing all of you are right. I'm guessing because of the, the, the space that, that it is over here. Okay. I'm just going to take a quick look here for the crack at how many questions we have. 21 questions. 21 questions. That's great. Keep them coming. Certainly keep them coming. And it's lovely. Some people are then going back and saying thank you to the team as well for answering them. So keep the questions coming. Obviously, as well, we're going to have a panel discussion too where I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, building on what Ashling shared with us. 
So but it's important that we that you make sure get all your questions asked. That's what we're here for. It's a big ask, I know, fifth and sixth year asking for 90 minutes of an evening on, on a Tuesday. So just make it worth your while. Right, 56 of you, 56 of you uh, have answered me. 49 have given me same answer. And of course, that answer is correct, which is 277 euro. Now, next question, though, is this one. How much is in sterling? is the full week state pension. I should really be looking at the same thing here, which is a massive spike of the correct number. Go and look for it. Go and look for it. It'll take you a second. Go and look for it. Find the right answer. And then I have another question after that that ties it all together. How much in sterling? All right, so in sterling, currencies matter, right? They really matter. So that's why it, it is important for me to specify which one. Uh, so, okay, 17 of you, I'm seeing another spike here. 25, 26, I'm guessing this is just going to all spike at the same spot. So how much in sterling is the full weekly state pension in the UK in 2024? Again, specifically in 2024, no budgets, no plans for next year, nothing like that. Just want to see what you're going to tell me right here. Okay, where are we at now? We're at 49, 49 out of the number that I have here. There's more of you here than that, as I say, a lot, 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 lot more than that. So just going to give the rest of you there a moment to go and check that out. Now, the next question it brings the two together and there's a little bit more work involved. So that's important that you're aware of that. Okay, right. Let's see. 53 of you have answered me here. And I have 49 of the same answer. And what is that? £221 sterling. Yes. Okay. Now, take both of these pieces of data into consideration, the Irish pension and the UK pension. But now what I'm going to ask is this question. In comparison to the state pension in Ireland, is the UK amount higher or lower if you translate the UK pension into euro based on today's exchange rate? So you need to think here now. You need to think. So what you need to do is take the sterling pension, multiply it by today's exchange rate and compare it to the Irish pension. Take your time. Take your time. So the question is, in comparison to the state pension in Ireland, is the UK amount higher or lower if you translate it into euro based on today's exchange rate? Now, I'm going to stop sharing there because what I want to do is I want to pull up a page that's going to show me how I can calculate that super quick. Okay. Actually, do you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I've calculated that from the beginning. So let's just see where you're at over here first. Right, there's 45 of you have answered me now. So let's, another three questions there have come in. Wonderful. Okay. Um, great. Now, Let's take, let's take a look here. There's yeah, loads more coming in. All right, so so far out of the 50 of you, right, you seem to be very clear on this, but let's go and actually cal calculate this out. Now, first of all, here is how I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm going to go and, and just follow me now. Do the same on your own. Open up a, a Google uh, browser, right? So I'm guessing if you're on a laptop and you're watching this, well, then just open up another tab and just listen to me as I talk it through it. If you're on another device, then do, do it somewhere else. So here, here's what I need you to type. Now, just listen to me. Listen to me, right? E, I sc we'll scroll up there. E-U-R-G-B-P. I'll say that again. I'll say it twice more. E-U-R-G-B-P. One more time. E-U-R-G-B-P. Now, look what happens when I Google that. Those letters is then it automatically shows me what the euro is in the equivalent of sterling. Now, those letters, right, those six letters is the foreign exchange code for the euro sterling exchange rate. Now, next up, what I need to do is that I need to see how much 221 pounds is in sterling. So I'm just going to delete. Come back over here now and look at my screen again. Just going to give you a second. There. Come back in, come back over here and look at my screen again. So what I did was I Googled EURGBP. This is what I got, right? So come back over here into my screen and then you can see it. Now, here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the number beside pound sterling. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to put in 221. And automatically, we're big into automation around here. Automatically, it now will tell me how much that 
sterling amount is in the equivalent in euro. So as you can see here, it's 265 euros and 19 cents, which of course is less than 277. Therefore, boom, you are correct, right? 51 out of 53 of you are correct. Well done. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, here we go. Now, this does require more research. And I am going to ask you to think about, okay, your client needed you 10 years ago to manage assets to meet pension requirements today. Which stock market enabled those assets to grow the most? Was it Japan, the US, emerging markets, or Europe? Now, think and research. So I'll read it out again. Your client, so your client could be a government. Your client could be a pension fund of a company. Your, it could be whoever it was, your client needed you to manage the assets 10 years ago, 10 years ago. So in 2014, the year I got married, again, that's irrelevant to any actuarial assumptions, but your client needed you to manage assets 10 years ago to meet pension requirements today. Which stock market would have enabled those assets to grow the most? I'm going to stop. I'm, I'm going to stop talking here now for a moment. Just let you think. And I can see that our panelists have arrived, both of them. So I can see there that they're in the green room digitally. All right. So far, 100% of people saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I will have my source and I will show it to you what it is. 27 of you so far. Take your time. Just go and find what the correct answer is. So was it the Japanese stock market? Was it the emerging markets market? Or was it Europe? Or was it the US? 31 of you have answered me so far. So what you would need to be looking at for now, for anybody who's still looking, because I'm guessing that there's about another 30 people here who are currently researching this. So here's the question that you need to ask. Fundamentally, what I was asking is this, which stock market has performed the best over the past 10 years? Ask the question. Which stock market has performed the best over the past 10 years? Because what I've asked you is basically that. Your client needed you to manage assets to meet the liabilities or to meet the pension requirements to pay out today. The question is, which assets would have grown the most? In other words, which market performed the best over the past 10 years? All right, there is 40 of you who have answered me. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to give you a link in the chat, right? Because I love talking about this particular this particular interactive, right? I'm just going to put this in the chat. Here's the answer. The answer, you're all, like, you were correct, right? The US. But look at this. I'm just going to put this link in the chat. Now, follow me over here now. Click on the link. Can everyone go on? Click on the link and follow me. Click on the link there and I will show you a couple of really cool things about this. All right. Just going to give you the chance there to click on the link. Uh, I don't have a QR code for this. If you're if you're on a separate device, just you can just, just watch my screen. Okay. Presume you're all there now. Now, look at this, right? Re change this to relative to zero and look at this. Boom. Isn't that cool? I love that. Anyway. So you can see here now, relative to zero, this is the column that I'm looking at here over the past 10 years. So, and this, this is up to date for October, 2024. Look here at this. We can see that over the past 10 years, the best performing stock market was US. Indeed, you were, you were spot on. Vast majority of you were spot on. However, look at who was next. It was Japan. Japanese equities was, and, and by the way, the word equity, is another word for share, which is another word for stock. There are slight variations, tweaks between them. But these are a subset of assets. And this is what actuaries need to do. Actuaries need to figure out, like, what is the liability that I need to deliver, or not that I need, that the portfolio needs to deliver? I'm going to start that sentence again. What liability does the portfolio need to meet? So what is the liability? How much does it need to pay out in pensions or in insurance? And then, of course, the next thing is ALM, Asset Liability Management. How do you go and invest the assets to make sure that they can deliver upon the liabilities? So over the past 10 years, 
US equities topped the pops at 13.3% on average over the past 10 years. Next one, Japanese equities at 6.8%. I'm just going to keep going on the green for the moment because they're the stock ones. Europe is up next. And Europe is up next at 6.2%. And then we had EM, emerging market equities at 4.4%. And then China, China equities at 3.6%. Interestingly, there wasn't any market that did, didn't deliver a positive annualized return over the past 10 years, which is an interesting point. Now, on the other hand, then down here, we've got bonds and bonds are basically loans that are listed on the markets. High yield would be a specifically risky type of loan. Then you have emerging market debt, which is a debt issued by governments in emerging market uh, countries. Then you have IG, which is investment grade, and then you have cash, and then you have developed market government debt. Beyond the scope of tonight, but look at this. I really like this. You can also see different commodities over here. Commodities only deliver 2% over, on average over the past 10 years. And of course, the years of very high inflation would have been a different story. But that is that. You, you have the link there now for the BlackRock asset return map. And I better keep going here quickly because I've only nine more minutes with you before we get into our panel discussion. And I still have loads more to ask you to do. Okay, next up. If the code to add two numbers together on Google Sheets is, look at that, look, now look at the code, look at it, look at it first, equals left bracket, A2 plus B2, right bracket, then what is it to multiply the two numbers together? And take, look at it now, take your time and look at it. I'm actually gonna put it together on a Google Sheet. So far, 15 of you have, 17 of you have answered. You're all saying the same thing. That's not to say it's right, but you are all saying the same thing. How's our Q&A going back there? 25 answered questions. Okay. Wow. Yep. Yeah, 25. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Okay. 25 answered questions so far. It's a good thing that we have the number of people that we have in the background. All right. 39 of you all saying the same thing. Are you correct is the question. Now, if I was answering this question, I would have actually gone on to a Google Sheet and I would have found cell A2 and found cell B2 and then in the cell beside, actually, you know what? Never mind me talking about what I would do. Let me do it. I'm going to go in here. So this here is cell, what did I say? A2, is it? A2. Okay, A2. Here's A2. A, this is A, two is here, right? So I'm going to put in the number. Um, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put in a random number. I'm going to code in a random number equals R-A-N-D, right? Here's a random number, okay? A random number equals R-A-N-D, right? I'm going to get another random number and put them here. So every time this, this refreshes, it'll just keep, it'll keep updating. And this is the thing. Actuaries are always, always, always dealing with information that's constantly changing. Our life expectancy is changing. The amount of money in the stock market is changing. The liabilities are changing. People's incomes are changing. They're constantly dealing with different data. So the models that they need to come up with need to factor in, not just two and two equals four, but instead, Two could be one tomorrow and three the next day and back to four and all sorts of things like that. Now, I said that how to add these two numbers together is equals left bracket A2 plus B2. Okay? The question I was asking was if I wanted to multiply these two together, what would it be? And my answer is equals left bracket. I click on A2 and here's the difference. I star. I star in between A2 and B2, right bracket. If I leave that bracket out on the right, it, Google Sheets will automatically put it back in. I'm just going to, uh, yeah, it just, keep, just keeps putting it back in. And that is, you are all spot on and correct. If you leave the right bracket out, Google Sheets gets, gets confused. It's like, what's going on here? Uh, how am I supposed to do this? If you put in an X, it does not work. It does not work. It needs to be a star. If you put in X, it just doesn't work. It breaks the code. It breaks the code. Now, Ashley Bernock is probably looking at me saying, this is super, super, super simple code here, Susan. Does it even count as code? Well, it kind of does. Uh, it, but it is super, as you can see, it's a super basic equation. But the thing is that people who code do a lot, 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 lot more complicated than this. But what I wanted to show is two things. One, actuaries are dealing with dynamic data. They're constantly dealing with dynamic data. Stuff that or not stuff, data that is always, always changing. So if I refresh that, it'll change again. And the second thing is, is that algorithmically, they need to figure out how 
not to be going back and constantly adding these two numbers together or multiplying these numbers together. But what model can happen so that then the output of whatever process they want to put in between different pieces of data are constantly updating so that then they can get on with, as Ashlyn says, the real work and, and the enjoyable work along the way. All right. Now, next up. God, I have so much more yet to do with you. Right. Rate, rank these experiences in terms of risk from highest to lowest. Now, when I say risk, I mean risk of death. Okay, so what do you think? Motorbike, private plane, commercial flight. But commercial flight is, so pri a pr private plane is where I'm like sitting in a private jet, right? And let's just see. Let's just see what you think here. Go and research them. Go and research them, please. And I have mine here. Okay, so this is in terms of risk of death, right? So if you if you're going to insure somebody, not now not the not the not the pay, like not the vehicle, a person. So in in so you tell me now in terms of fatalities, and this is the numbers that I have here. I actually can't pull up this link on the internet that I'm on because it uh, the firewall blocked it. So I have it here on the phone instead, but I still know the answer. Okay, right. So you have motorbikes first. Interesting. Okay. Your motorcycle is first. Uh, you have car is second. Private plane is third. And uh, let me see here. And then you have commercial flights last. Okay. So the answer is in terms of the number of fatalities between 10, 2010 and 2019, that's the number that I'm going to give you. Only the first six of you have answered so far. Oh, come on. Come on. Bring it on. Keep coming. Keep coming with your answers here. 38. Right. Go and research it for sure. But um, I, I have the answer here. It's looking at me. It is looking at me here. And uh, let's see here. Forty-five. Okay, that's looking that's look that's looking better. Right. Here's the answer. Might surprise you. Um, the actually, in terms of risk, the highest risk based on what I'm looking at here is cars. It's actually cars. The and and now, it's not per per journey. It is in in total. And the reason that a car is riskier when you look at the overall level of fatalities is because a lot more people travel in a car than they do a motorbike. Then the next one is indeed, as you're right, motorcycle. Then the next one is a private plane. And then the next one is a commercial flight. So like that's a flight between, say, Dublin and Dubai or Dublin and New York. Is the commercial flying is actually very, very, very safe. It's it's the the sheer, they, you know, the way they say you're safer in the air than you are on the ground is the case. Uh, when it comes to when when it comes to measured by by fatalities, that actually is is the case. So more accidents happen in a car relative to a motorbike, but that's also down to the frequency of where the fatalities are coming from. Okay, let's keep going. Next question for you: Which county has the lowest cost car insurance? So you need to put the picture pin on the uh, put a pin here on the picture. Mayo is what one person has said. Mayo for Sam. Yeah, okay. So let's see what else you have. And go and research it. It's, it's easy to find. It's super quick to find. Super quick. So go and take a look. And I'm just going to ask Mairead and uh, and Rebecca, if we can just ask you to, to be ready to go shortly. I am going to be switching over to you. And not the, after this question, the next one. Okay, so 12, you say what? 13, you say what? All right, okay. Now, again, it, it's interesting, the different sources that we have, because I'm going to fill them up here. Yeah, okay. The 23 of you are saying Watford. Four of you saying Kenny. Two of you saying Leitrim, is it? Looks like more than that. Uh, one of you saying Cavan. No one's saying Dublin. 31 of you, all right. Now, because I know my panelists are here and I, I have so many more questions yet that I could be asking you, I obviously prefer to have far more questions ready to be asking you to think like actuaries rather than instead fewer. Uh, so here is the answer. So 
average car insurance price by county is Kilkenny. It's Kilkenny based on, now this is my source. So perhaps because a lot of you picked Waterford, so you might have a more recent source. But this is where I was going, was from the Chill Insurance Car Insurance Pricing Index, and that was last updated in January. So if you have a more recent uh, a more recent source, you may be right. And what I can see here is Kilkenny, and it is uh, it is 541 is the average price. Waterford is up next, then Mayo, then Leash, then Cork, where I'm from. Uh, well, sorry, there's a few more in between. The most expensive place is Longford, if you don't mind. Longford! And Louth, look, seems to be a trend here of counties beginning with L. All right, one last question, and then I'm bringing in my panellists. Next up is this one. So a new housing development has been built in a town close to you. So if you're now to think about house insurance, right? In the past, I've asked you about personal insurance, I've asked you about pensions, I've asked you about returns, I've asked you about car insurance, but now house insurance. So a new housing development has been built in a town close to you. What factors might affect the premium and insurer charges to home buyers? Let's just think. Now, this is the point at which you really need to think like an actuary. So what do you think determines it? Okay. What determines the risk? Yeah, okay. Interesting. Okay. Blood, size of the house. Right. What else? Number of burglaries. Yeah, smoke alarm. Okay. Near a body of water. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blood risk location. Yeah. Age of the house, electric heating. Burglar alarm. No, that's different to actual burglaries is our burglar alarm. Okay. Uh, claims history. Ener energy rating. Okay. Construction of materials claim. Okay. Okay. Now, 20 eyes currently have, you can send in as many answers as you want. I currently have 31 people who have answered me with 41 responses. And we are, I'm looking here, we are now two minutes past eight. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds to wrap this up. We have 51 responses at this point from 37 people and now they keep coming. All right, so keep, keep coming. All right, I am now going to, I, I'm going to run an AI in the background. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to see what your, what were the, uh, I'm going to group the responses here. Okay, so what have we got? Uh, we've got a very accurate set of answers, actually. So we have primary security, 18 of you said that, 11 of you said location, 7 of you said house size, 6 of you said uh, proximity to services, 5 of you said environmental factors, 5 of you said claims history, 4 of you said um, age of the property, yeah. Three of you said building materials, and uh, then there's other ones then that have that have just come in. Okay, well done. Yep, yeah, they're 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 right on point there. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I am going to ask you another question a little bit later on, but now I'm going to turn my questions to Hamred and Rebecca. Uh, I'm just going to ask you both here to join me on, on screen, which you have done. Thank you. Okay, so before we get started, as you can see, there is lots and lots and lots of questions, 30 questions that have come in that have already been answered in the background by the team. So can we start off by asking you both, will you tell us a little bit about what you do and your story of how you got there? So Rebecca, will we start with you, then we go to Mairead? So tell us yep. a little bit about you, how you got there. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm currently working in a consulting company in Dublin. Um, I'd say my main area of work is in life insurance. Um, I graduated from UCD two years ago, so I've just gone to my second year working and I just passed my last exams there in the last exam setting. So recently qualified and I've been doing my exams for the last two years before that. Um, and for that, I did the, the Basque degree, the actuarial degree in UCD for four years. A lot of studying going on there, Rebecca. The, yeah. Yes, indeed. As one might expect for someone in your position. Okay. And Mairead, how about you? Yeah. Um. So I did the actuarial degree in Queens in Belfast. I graduated in 2018. Seems like a long time ago now. And I was then working in the reinsurance industry for a company called Score for four years. And then after that, I moved to uh, New Ireland, who are kind of uh, linked to Bank of Ireland, where I work in kind of life and pensions business and um, I've been there for about two years now. 
And what, by the way, Marie, did you think of the responses there that we've been getting in from people about, for example, if they're insuring houses or the quality of the answers that we've seen to the questions? Because I know you both were there in the background watching as we were going along. They were definitely very good. I don't think when I was at school, my answers would have been as well thought out to tell the truth. So uh, I was very impressed. Good, good, good stuff. Good, good stuff indeed. So, Rebecca, we'll start off with you. And I'm going to start off with skills because Ashling at the beginning talked about like the main skills involved in being an actuary. So what is the most valuable skill you use on a daily basis to help you succeed as an actuary? Um, I think I'd probably say problem solving skills. Um, I think that can be sort of applied to no matter what task you're doing. I think there's always a problem solving element. Um, I think a lot of the tasks you might work on as an actuary, there's not necessarily a sort of clear right answer. So being able to think through different solutions, like logically and creatively and coming up with the best option. I think like, you know, coding work or if you're like analyzing data and then deciding how best to present results um, using your problem solving skills in that way. Mm. And does it feel like maths in the leaving cert, like is problem solving today the same as how it felt doing, you know, paper two, question one? back in the day um, sometimes it's, it's obviously different I'm never sitting down with my pen and paper doing my maths but I do think the sort of uh, feeling you get when you spend a long time working through a question and you finally get the right answer you definitely get that when you've been working through a problem and you eventually like it clicks and you've got the, the answer at the end of it um, mm. so I think that sort of rewarding part of it is still there great stuff so pro problem solving Mairead what would you say would you say something similar or have you got a new one to add um, no, I think problem solving and probably as part of that being pragmatic about things, you know, common sense is a big factor in it too, because as Rebecca said, there's not always a right answer. So you have to consider how much do you have time to do? How many people do you have? You know, what kind of skills do they have? So I feel like that's a big thing that people probably don't expect um, common sense and being pragmatic about things. But is it also about likelihood? Is it also about how accurate the answer needs to be or how likely something might be to happen? Does does that feature into the the you know the, the accuracy of what you need to work towards? Yeah, I definitely would say so, you know, maybe if Rebecca just wants to get a sense of how much business we sold, but she just wants to know for her own purposes, I'll not have to do as many checks and I can just give her a number. Whereas if the central bank come looking a number obviously but the stakes are a bit higher so we need to do a few more checks and make sure everything's uh, tallied up actually you know that's an even better way of describing it rather than what i said which is uh, rather than likelihood it's about the stakes is that what is the consequence of getting this wrong um can we go back to school for a while right so can i just ask you right i know you're probably going to both say maths is going to be the answer to the question that i'm going to ask which is which school subjects helped you most in your in your degree or, or no sorry not in your degree in your career path so far but so I, I'm expecting you to say maths right but in terms of other subjects are there any other subjects that were particularly helpful along the way Rebecca we might start with you uh, yeah so I guess when I was picking my subjects I didn't know what I wanted to do so I kind of went with the broad options like a, I did accounting German uh, biology uh, and history um, I think obviously yeah, maths is the main one so enjoying maths having a good aptitude for it and uh, doing higher level maths um, is required to get into the, the actuarial degrees um, and then I think the most beneficial out of those sort of option ones that I picked was probably accounting mm. um, definitely wasn't a requirement but you do do some modules on that when you go to college mm -hmm. um, I think maybe if I was going back and picking ones that would be more beneficial maybe like economics or applied maths might have been useful but at the same time not having them is fine you do do them when you get to college anyways I did have applied maths and I didn't have economics ironically I never studied economics in school at all despite writing the textbook for it later on with teachers but I so I'd have loved it at the time sure uh, I found applied maths is it just helps you think logically just like maths does itself it's just now you're applying it to more physical problems so um yeah I would see why one would say that and accounting yeah accounting is just I loved it though really liked really liked accounting too Maureen how about you yeah so I was obviously in the north so we just do four levels and again I chose the broad ones because I didn't know that I was going to do actuary so I did biology chemistry maths and geography so definitely very broad not actually focused at all and I think if I was to go back, I would probably do ICT or computers. I'm not sure what you call it in the South. 
but on my day-to-day job if my computer wasn't working I I wouldn't get very far and definitely Mm -hmm. when I started my internship that gap that I had in terms of Excel was painstakingly obvious that's probably something I'd do if I was to go back and maybe a few more kind of businessy subjects like business studies or economics because as Rebecca said that's a lot of your kind of initial model modules in university and I definitely yeah didn't have any kind of foundation on that I remember one of my first lectures they kept using the word entity and I had no idea what that meant and I later found out that it meant business but yeah so I definitely recommend those kind of subjects but Mairead, can you settle settle the record here for us now, just in case anybody thinks that, you know, students in an R2, four subjects, you do half the work the rest of us do. Right. Can you just actually settle the record here? So would would you, if you're doing four subjects, do you do them in more detail than in the Leaving Cert? Yeah. Yeah, we would have far more classes a week of that particular subject. Yeah. You definitely couldn't do six or seven A-levels. I don't, you probably wouldn't have time to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that so if any of you are thinking of going through the UCAS system, uh, just be aware that the deadlines for those UCAS is, is how you gain access to the universities in the UK. Uh, just be aware that the deadlines for that is much earlier than the CAO. We're running a, a webinar around that in next week, actually, for for students who anybody who might be interested, let, let me know. But it's definitely just the difference between the two systems is, is significant. So highs and lows. Tell us. Uh, Ashling earlier on said if you like maths and money actuary is a good home for you the maths and money bit I quote unquote the rest I paraphrased tell us the highs and lows Rebecca what are the highs and lows of being an actuary um, I'd say you get to work on interesting pieces of work um, so if you like maths and sort of that way of thinking um, I think you'll enjoy the sort of work you get to do as an actuary um, then I quite like that I get to work with a lot of really clever people so I think that's kind of, you know, good work environment. Um, it's challenging and you're constantly learning, like either through your exams when you're a student or there's professional development that you're always doing throughout your career. And um, then obviously it's well paid. <laughs> so yes, agree with Ashling to, to that extent. Um, and I think it's a well-regarded profession as well. So it's just a really good qualification to have. Rebecca, um, you're selling it well. You're selling it well here now. Like, you know, this is the thing. I'm thinking 20 years ago now, should I've kept going. I know I'm very, very happy with the path I pursued. But all all of those are highs. What about yeah. the lows? Uh, well, obviously, there's a lot of exams. Um, but I do think it's maybe not as daunting as it might look. Um, you know, if you get, or sorry, if you do a, a, an actual degree in college, you can get um, a lot of exemptions from a lot of the earlier exams. Mm-hmm. Um, which can really cut down the sort of time you're spending doing exams after that. But uh, like you do also get a lot of study leave through your employer, um, like a day a week coming up to the exams. And then uh, you could even get like a week or two off before the exam, um, mm-hmm. which really makes it a lot more manageable, I think. So would I be right then in thinking, Mairead, that the, the highs persist forever and the lows wear off after you finish your studying? It's all happy days. Um, I don't think it's realistic that they're all happy days, but I don't think anyone in any job says that. Um, but I do think the happy days definitely are much more frequent. It's those days when you're studying that are the toughest, but as with any job, there's like frustrations on a daily basis, but not enough to like put me off the job. I would definitely choose the same thing if I was to do it again. And as Ashley or Rebecca, sorry, said, it's that like every day being different that I find, you know, the days kind of fly by because you're always learning, you know, even after the exams no two quarters will ever be the same and it's applying what you know and kind of building that stronger foundation and I find that really rewarding even looking at how much you progress as a person you know last year you might not know the answer but now you could suss it out for yourself so I definitely find that quite rewarding although that is frustrating but when you get the answer it's really rewarding. That's a very good point actually and I would share that experience in my own business in different ways is that where I might not have known the answer last year I might today and that whether that could be on a technology or a technical point or managing people point or or others. That's yeah, so that you're you're constantly adding, adding to, to that personal development. I'm very aware that so far we have had 37 questions, Rebecca. A lot of people are here, and I know people are here tonight to be here, but also I know that there's some teachers who are here tonight as well, and they want the recording to share with their class. So a lot of people are probably interrogating their options and they're thinking okay is it for me is it not how 
does one determine if it's for them? You've told us a lot about like what you do, the highs, the study, the maths, the aptitude, the problem solving, the working in challenging situations and with a lot of clever people. Is that it? Is that the checklist? If I like all of that, do I go for it? Or is there any more you'd like to put forward? Um, I think that is the basis of liking maths and that sort of problem solving and then wanting to apply those skills in a business and financial context because uh -huh. um, it is, well, like it is an office job um, and so wanting to work in that sort of an environment. Um, I think just try and find out as much as you can about the, the course and the profession. If you know anybody that you can talk to or even going to open days for colleges, I think is very useful where you might get to meet, meet some students um, and ask them what their sort of first-hand experience is like. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you do your research, talk, talk to people. But I think that that's a very important point here is that it's within a business and finance context. And that brings together what you were both saying about studying business or economics or, or accounting or any of those, or ICT, as you mentioned too, Mairead, is that at the end of the day, that's the type of environment that you're likely to be in. And therefore that sense of liking to be in that is important too. Mairead, how did you go from matching your own like history, geography, uh, I'm just make sure I have all of the subjects here right now. Accounting and biology. I think they were the four that you said, four A levels. Am I right? Um, biology and chemistry and geography, but you're close enough. <laughs> oh, well, now you're 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 letting me all wait, wait there nicely. But how how did you then make the leap from those four A levels to Queens to to studying actually in Queens? What happened? Yes, fair question. So, as a lot of people, I was going into my final two years of school and had no idea really what I wanted to do I knew what I liked in terms of subjects and what I was good at so I picked those I suppose to play to your strengths which is what everyone does and had always loved maths never felt like studying but in my head and it's quite a like silly thing when I think of it now but in my head to pursue my maths the only option for me was to be a teacher and that was oh. definitely at the time among my friends that was kind of what it was even now sure there's so many things engineering and actuary and all but it's actually my maths teacher said to me one day, I can remember her saying it, she said, Maria, don't think you have to give up your maths, you know, if you really love it, like look at your options. And she suggested actuary to me. And I definitely had a perception of actuary. Whilst it is tough as this absolutely impossible task and, you know, I would never have been fit for it. And that's why I never considered it. And then she kind of said, no, no, you definitely are. And I didn't have much you know detail on what it was so I was lucky that I did it and enjoyed it but you know resources like this today and getting work experience and all I think would have been great and suppose I would have been more sure in my decision. Mm. Uh, That's interesting how you saw the way to pursue maths was simply through teaching and there's there's lots of ways of pursuing it I would say today might be different but that's that's interesting that that, that was matched uh, for you. Both of you went to college uh, two different ones, in fact, two very different jurisdictions. Um, both of you then have gone on to study the exam. So so if you don't do like financial maths and economics like I did in Galway or Rebecca, like the course that you did or the course that Ashling did. So is there any other way to get into actually apart from like pretty high points courses and pretty small number of them? Rebecca, do you work with anybody who hasn't done that? I don't work with Anna Nelson, but I definitely know there are people. Um, you don't have to do an actuary degree to do the professional exams. Um, if you do a, any sort of like maths based degree, you can go on to do the exams after college. Um, depending on the course, you might get some exemptions or you might not. Um, so there will be more exams for you to do after, but it's definitely possible for you to go on and do the exams by yourself if you haven't done actuary as an undergrad. And uh, Mairead, what's been your experience? Um, definitely in New Ireland, where I am now, we have a real uh, mix of backgrounds, which is really nice to see. And I suppose it brings people who think in different ways or look at things differently. Um, I think I work with a girl and she did theoretical physics and she uh, joined in the graduate programme. And as Rebecca said, it just means you mightn't get as many exemptions. So you have more exams to do on your own. But that's definitely a really valid option. And I think we also had an intern who was doing maybe a maths degree in DCU, but she was able to just kind of do a summer internship with us to get a flavour of what being an actuary was like. 
and those kinds of things. So there's definitely a lot of options. It's not just you have to do the uni degree and come out with your exemptions. You can definitely come in with another kind of suitable background. And then, so there's two steps really. One is studying a degree actuarial or, or I won't say otherwise it, it can't be it sounds like can't be something very very wildly off the mark and then from there pursuing the exams as well but at the end of the day it is the exams that determine who becomes an actuary as distinct to the degree okay now the most popular question of the night by the way and and I'm looking here like in fairness to the team there has 41 questions that have come in to Jenny to Jennifer to Ashling to Catherine they're flying there in terms of answering them uh, but the most popular question is after is this being recorded, which it is. But the second most popular question then is typical day to day work. So I remember interviewing Ashley in the past on this panel and she said, Susan, I'd prefer to answer what's a, a typical week if such a thing exists as well, rather than than a typical day. So can we just ask you, um, Rebecca, you're a, a typical week. What what goes on? I am. Um, well, yeah, obviously every week is different. So I think for me. I usually go into the office two to three days per week and then we'll work online at home for the other days. Um, most mornings I'll have like a catch up meeting with my team, um, discuss the different things we're working on, making sure everybody has enough work and make sure people aren't too busy either um, and discuss any problems we're having with our work. Um, then go through emails, might have some calls with clients, might have some internal calls with different people that I'm working with. Um, in terms of the actual things I work on, uh, Excel is a, a large portion of my day. Um, like me, like updating models, um, doing different sort of data analysis pieces. Um, sometimes I'll be involved in different pieces of research. Um, climate risk is quite a popular thing that we're doing a lot of research on currently in my workplace. Some different topical issues like that. Um, for my work, I do quarterly evaluations for insurance companies. Um, so. If it's quarterly evaluation week can be pretty busy. Um, some other things we help our clients with, like their business plans, that sort of thing. Um, I think like I get to work with a variety of different people in my company. So like from very senior actuaries to other sort of students and grads, um, to like placements or interns. So I like that variety as well. Um, and then sort of outside of sort of actuarial work, I'm on the social committee in my work and the CSR committee. So there's a bit of diversity to to my day um, and then I guess if you're in the middle of an exam period you have a day off a week for studying as well so that, that's for the typical week as well I mean you know it just sounds like the natural question to ask is so Rebecca what do you do in your spare time but uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that Mairead yours what does your typical day or week look like uh, so similar to Rebecca I work in kind of a reserve in our valuation space so I suppose a large part of my work is kind of on assumptions which would have been linked to the questions you've raised about what impacts say like house insurance prices and things. So I suppose if I describe this past week, I'm trying to set uh, mortality assumptions. So the kind of how long we expect the population in Ireland to live. So that kind of involves me every day, taking the, da the data, you know, looking at the trends we're seeing in our data and then looking out for kind of research, you know, within the broader market kind of on how, say larger companies see life trends going so it's embedding that into a report and then speaking to kind of my manager and more senior team members on their feelings or if they've heard anything in the market and incorporating that in so I suppose it's all quite kind of iterative it's uh, talking to everyone getting feedback giving your feedback and going again which I kind of like you know it means even if you're working from home you're still talking to loads of people and I actually only go into the office two days a week and then I work from home the other three. And yeah, similar to Rebecca too, you'd usually have a team catch up every day just to make sure no new priorities have came up or everyone's doing okay. And even just for the social side, it's nice that your day at home isn't a lonely day because you're still chatting to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's kind of my typical week. Lots of emails and lots of Excel, similar to Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> lots of emails, lots of Excel and lots of social, like social inter interaction with, with people as well, whether it's in the office, as you say, Marie, if it's your two days in or or, or when, when you're there. I'm I'm aware that we're, we're approaching the end of the session. So rather than ask you both for an answer to, to my next couple of questions, I'll just do a rapid fire round. And then I have one more question for the audience after that. And that is um, AI, Rebecca. Uh, people have been asking this type of question like, 
is AI going to either take away some parts of the job? Has it already? Do you think AI could actually do the job of an actuary in the future? What's your take? I am, I think it's definitely changing the way we're working in some ways, but I think it's more a focus on helping us do our job better rather than actually replacing actuaries. Um, so for example, ChatGPT might be able to write Python code, but it's then the actuary with the skills and sort of expert knowledge that has to analyze the results to make sure they make sense. Um, that I don't think can be replaced. Mm -hmm. There's also some like regulatory roles. So um, some of the like senior people in my company have to sign off to say that certain insurance companies are holding enough reserves. Um, and I don't think that could be replaced by AI because there's like the personal sort of accountability aspect of that, that mm -hmm. they need to be responsible for what they're signing off on. Um, that I don't think AI can replace, but it definitely is a, a very useful and beneficial tool to have access to while you're doing your day-to-day -day job. Um, like if it can write code for you, it saves you having to learn the syntax of every code, but you can do the more interesting parts of the coding. Mm -hmm. um, so it take, takes away the repeatable elements or the, the, the less interesting elements. Um, yeah. Mairead, there's loads of people asking questions here about the TY work experience, which is wonderful because we lead it. And uh, and anybody who is goes on to do the work experience will have a, a, an experience similar tonight, but, but for a much longer period of time. And how you, you were saying earlier on that it's important that people do at least try to get a work experience some, somewhere. How important are internships or work experiences? Now, obviously, TY is one age group, but particularly when you're in college, what was your experience? Um, so I went to Queen's and we typically do a year's placement, which is longer, I think, than used to be in DCU. And I actually ended up, I did 15 months, so I got a real kind of big stint. And for me, that was the first time I really thought, you know what, I can actually see myself being an actuary because you learn about all these things and doing all these calculations, but you're still in a lecture theatre. You have no concept of the office or how this would, you know, like transpire in a normal day-to-day -day work. So for me, that was really the big moment when I realised this is what I wanted to do. And I even think it's really good to like have that opportunity to make connections, you know, in a workplace and to hear advice from other people. And it kind of opens your eyes to all the different paths that you can go down. So I think sometimes in university you feel I just have to get out and do these exams and then I'll just work in this job till the end of time. And that's not really the case. And yeah. I find that was really good. And it also brings your skills on. Like, as I said, my Excel skills were terrible. But in your internship, people are so kind and so helpful and they want you to do well. So that really brings you on and it helps you for interviews too for like your first graduate job set. So I definitely would be a big advocate for any type of work experience you can get. Well, there's certainly hungry for it here anyway. In this <laughs> uh, in, in this background, we currently have 52 questions that have, have come in. Like even about eight for me. <laughs> the gang in the background there I have, have had 10 times that. Last rapid fire round question, Rebecca, and then I go one more to you, uh, Mairead, and that is decisions. What type of day-to-day -day decisions do you make, Rebecca? Oh, what type of decisions do I make? Um, so I think for the overall um, sort of key thing that my role contributes to, it's how much um, money the insurance company needs to keep back so they're able to pay claims. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm not necessarily making a key decision in this but carrying out calculations um to find out what that what what the number is mm -hmm. okay okay and Mariah, the last rapid fire round question to you is travel do you have the opportunities to and do you take them uh to travel uh yes i definitely think the qualification is one that travels well the it's globally recognized so you can pretty much go anywhere in the world in Dublin alone there's so many big multinational companies as I said I used to work for SCORE and I actually got a job in their Singapore office but it was in March 2020 so needless to say I didn't get to go anywhere but it's definitely if you want a career that's going to travel well and companies usually have good um the words not displacement um like travel opportunities so if that's you good. move from your yes from your home market they'll offer you a lot of support so it kind of makes that moving process a lot easier um, and yeah definitely like America Asia is such a big growth area Australia New Zealand anywhere if you want to go traveling like there's definitely so many opportunities 
Brilliant. Thank you both so much indeed. It's It's been really a, a fascinating 27 minutes interviewing you both. So I'm going to thank you indeed. If you want to switch off your camera, I have one last job to do now with everybody that's here. And that is, I am now going to ask you one last question. I'm going to send you back to Mentimeter and I'm going to share my screen back here. Okay. So we would now just like to ask you about your experience. Every time we run this webinar, for a start, it's always very, very popular. And we're only delighted to see that. So please refresh your refresh your Mentimeter there. And your answers are not going to appear on the screen. Instead, you have a quick form back there. Um, we always find that this, I, I did an Instagram video about this on, on our account there yesterday and on my own at Susan Hayes Culliton. And I always say this webinar is, is very popular for three reasons. One is because you get to hear the real deal. You get to hear what really life is like as an actuary. The second thing is because you hear a diversity of people. You hear from people who are at different stages, who've gone to different colleges, who were at different, different reasons of why they pursued it, who had different subjects in school. And the third reason is because you do actually get a chance to think and act and research like an actuary as well. And that's why we're here. All that said, while it's popular, we want to make sure it stays that way. And that's why, of course, we're asking for your feedback. So please do tell us what your experience was like. And after that, we will take leave of you this evening. Thank you so much indeed to every single one of you. There's been a huge number of you who have stayed on right throughout the 90 minutes. And of course, if you are joining me from uh, for the for the recording instead, you are most welcome. We're delighted that you were able to be here with us and make sure keep an eye on the website. It's just sai.savvyteens.com for any future events that are happening uh, related to transitioning your fifth year and sixth year. And definitely, definitely, definitely follow Society of Actuaries in Ireland. Follow them on social media, join their mailing list, get involved. Just keep an eye on what's been happening, what is going to, continues to happen. And also, uh, based on my conversation with uh, a couple of people involved in the, in the society, there's going to be a lot more coming up that there will be asking your opinion on as time goes on. Massive thank you to, of course, to Mairead and also to Rebecca for being there this evening to answer my incessant questions. Huge thank you to Ashley Bernock as well, who opened up this evening by talking us through the actuarial profession. Huge thank you to Catherine, to Jenny, to Jennifer, and to Ashley, who've been answering questions in the background, and also to Sinead Clark, who has been with us right throughout this experience to make sure that this evening happened. And to my own team, Eva and Caroline as well, as well as Emer, who have been working to make sure that everything went smoothly along the way. So on that note, have a lovely, fantastic evening. Please do, as I say, check out Society of Actuaries in Ireland on social media. And if you have any other questions, please do feel free to send them in. Thank you all and good night.